thank you, Andrew. Good morning, and I should say good afternoon to those across the other side of the ocean from where I am. And uh, thank you for attending this talk. I'm really excited to talk about this technology, which has been a part of my life, part of my professional life for uh, over 10 years in the field and use it almost every day as a radiation therapist. So without farther delay, let's talk about the agenda. We're going to talk about what is a cone beam, why do we use it, and basically I want to kind of get a feel for everybody who's attending. How familiar are you with this? As my understanding is, it's pretty new technology for most of the centers in Africa. So if you could please use your Zoom chat feature on a scale of one to 10, one being never heard of it and 10 being use it every day, completely comfortable with it. How familiar are you with comb beam CT? Please enter one through 10 in the chat so I can kind of get an idea for um, where to aim this conversation. I also want to say that during this, during this presentation that I, I see education as an inter, interaction and a collaborative effort. And so please use the chat at any time to ask questions or, you know, if I, if I state something incorrectly, you know, let me know. I'm not a physicist. I'm a radiation therapist. I use this technology as, a, as an end user and, you know, I, I have plenty to learn as well. So if you could please enter in the chat, scale of one to 10, your familiarity with cone beam CT. I'm also assuming a, a pretty good, uh, use of, uh, or familiarity with general CT for, for the, uh, attendees today. So if you're, if you're also, you know, if, if you're unfamiliar with CT, please mention it in the chat so that I can, I can also address those questions. All right. So what is a cone beam CT? It's, it's actually, it's a, a cone beam CT is a form of CT, computed tomography. So computed tomography uh, takes projections around an arc around the patient, around a 300, usually a 360 degree arc, but we'll, we'll talk about cone beam CT, why 360 degree arc isn't always necessary. But so instead of taking a two-dimensional image, like a, like a radiograph or an x-ray image that we're, that everyone's familiar with, a CT takes hundreds to thousands of images. And so just like an x-ray, uh, the images in a CT are formed by attenuation in the tissue. That is, the x-rays travel through the patient at different, different degrees, depending on the density which the beam passes through. So CT, which was developed like in actually a lot, lot, long time ago, you know, in the 60s and 70s, takes all that image, Im, all that image information and using, you know, computer algorithms reconfigures that information from hundreds to thousands of x-rays into a three-dimensional model of a patient. So what a cone beam CT does is what's different from a, a regular CT scanner that we're all used to is that it uses the whole x-ray beam in a, you know, if you can picture an x-ray, like a, you know, collimated as a, as a cone, as it travels out. Well, in a CT scanner, the, the collimation is, is tighter. And uh, more importantly, the collimation on the detectors is really tight. So even though, you know, it's still, it's still sort of a cone beam in a regular CT, the detectors are only letting a little tiny slit of that through. And as the CT spins around the patient, the, as the CT spins around the patient, the patient's moving through the bore, the scanner. Okay. So, so it's very, it's a very high resolution for diagnostic CT, which is what most of our treatment plan planning is based off of. But with the cone beam, you, you can actually use the whole x-ray beam with a flat square or rectangular shaped panel. And that panel re, re takes the data and turns it into a, a CT image. So the, the, the downside of using that, that technology is that there's not as great of resolution just because there's not as much data for each transverse slice of the patient. So here's a picture of an actual, a comb beam on a linear accelerator, how it works. So you can see as the linear accelerator is coming around the patient, 
you have an x-ray tube. Okay, so you have an x-ray tube here. And here's the patient. So here's your cone beam. Here's your detector. The detector is a flat panel. Okay, so in a CT, the, there's going to be an x-ray tube and a panel, but there's just going to be a narrow slit that's allowed through. So it gets better resolution. Basically, the basically the the reason why this is so useful is because we we can actually they they devised a way to attach this apparatus to the linear accelerators while retaining the isocentric precision so that you can actually put the patient in the treatment position and uh, and take a three-dimensional image of the patient's uh, anatomy in real time. That is while the patient's on the table for the treatment. All right, so here's a review of anatomy. So we're gonna, we're gonna review a little anatomy because we're gonna actually be looking at some of these um, pictures later. So sagittal plane from anatomy is if we're looking at the patient as if they were, okay, I'm gonna say sliced because there are slices, but if the patient was sliced from down the middle of the nose, down the sternum, down the belly button, okay. So we're looking from the side. Okay, so in this picture, can anyone, can we, can we talk about what this is? This is pubic symphysis, okay? Cossex. okay, this is a male patient. This is the base of the penis. Okay. We have prostate here, bladder here, bowel, over here and a rectum over here. Okay, coronal plane. Now this is as if patient is sliced down the side. So you're looking straight at the patient. So we have same, same an anatomy here. We have pelvis. So we have uh, prostate, bladder, ilium, acetabulum, et cetera. Uh, now this is the transverse plane and CT is um, acquired in this plane. So what I mean by that is all the data that is, that is uh, acquired from the CT spinning around the patient like this, this is the first reconstruction. So this is the kind of the most used of the planes. So this is what, this is as if you slice the patient down the half. Okay. So I've, I've heard it been described like a loaf of bread. So if you if the patient's a loaf of bread, you're slicing the patient like this, okay? From an imaging perspective. And you're always looking from the uh, feet towards the head. So this is the left side, this is the right side. And again, we're for this patient, we're looking at pelvis again. So this is rectum, prostate. I guess that's a tiny bit of the bladder right there, pubic symphysis. And you have like muscles here. Okay, this is the, you know, the glute muscles. In Africa, are a lot of the patients being treated for, for prostate cancer? Uh, if you could mention in comments if that's, if that's a common treatment site. And the reason, I, the reason why we mention is because it, it's one of the first sites that was really used a lot with uh, cone beam CTs because of the, the mobility of that, of that target. So advantages of the cone beam is, okay, well, we can see a lot of soft tissues that we can't see with regular two-dimensional radiographs. Um, we can, we're, not, we're not seeing as good of resolution or as great of images as the planning CT because of the, the nature of cone beam is, is not as, not as, as accurate it's, as far as the imaging the soft tissues, but it's pretty darn good and it's getting better. And why would we want to visualize patient anatomy in 3D? Well, we're doing, we're doing plans that aren't, that aren't, we're not just doing APPA plans all the time. Okay, so APPA is through and through more or less dose distribution. It's kind of uniform. It's kind of the dose is, is, is pretty much there all the way through the, the portal. So, but with, with three, with, you know, as you add more beam angles, you're going to get, you're going to get a higher dose gradient. So you're going to get higher dose to the target while minimizing the dose to the surrounding tissues. And then, you know, IMRT and BMAT, those are the next iterations from just changing the number of angles. Then you're changing the, the fluence of the x-rays through the patient. So you have very highly 
targeted, highly conformal plans. So you have to, when you have highly, highly targeted, highly conformal plans, like you have to go back to simulation and say, well, is the patient positioned the same way? And are the tissues the same way or that they were during simulation? And, you know, we make a lot of assumptions based on portals. Bony anatomy is on, well, the soft tissues are on, but we know that that's not always true. There's other reasons we can use comb beam other than just checking the fidelity to the treatment plan of soft tissue. So we can also see respiratory motion. They have a comb beam now that takes into account the, the respiratory cycle. So the, the comb beams only actually being acquired while the patient's in this particular user-defined part of the respiratory cycle. And then, you know, the, the physician might want to see if the tumor shrinking. So, you know, it's very common for them to order a weekly comb beam. So they can monitor the, the changes in the tumor size from week to week, and then they might decide to do a cone. And just keep in mind that because of what we're doing with radiation therapy, with the, the modeling and the precision, the, the very high dose gradients, okay, that means we have to be, we have to be very cognizant of, of that we're hitting the target. And so comb beam helps with that because we can actually overlay the model, the simulation model with the real time scan. And we can see where those dose contours, the radiation oncologist can see where those dose contours are lying. The next step of this, and it's already happened with certain, with, with, you know, Varian has machines. There's, there's other companies that have machines using MRIs is that we're actually looking at the dose that's being delivered. So whereas you know, the, the method that's been used for radiation therapy is we model, we model the dose or via simulation, and then we, we deliver the treatment and we, we, we do our quality assurance by taking portal films and such. And comb beams, comb beams, essentially another type of, of, well, it's not exactly a portal film, but it's an, it's in the same ballpark, but the next step will be adaptive radiation therapy, where we take the, the imaging on the table. And then the patient is replanned every day. So that's, that's really where radiation therapy is heading. That's a whole nother discussion. So what's going on here? We are looking at two comb beams up here. Okay. First treatment. So we have our sagittal view. You can see right here, it says sagittal. We have our frontal view. We have our transverse view. And if this was a live picture, I would, I would be pressing this little curly Q thing because I want to see the axial, the transverse view. Axial transverse views interchangeably, but this is just a screenshot. So, so we're looking at, can anyone, can anyone say what, what they think this target is? It's, it's a sarcoma. So it's a tip tumor of the muscle. So we can see on the first treatment, this green contour I'm assuming is like a PTV volume, okay? But you can see that the, the thing that they're aiming at is this, this bulbous, this bulbous uh, muscle, okay? So you can see at the first treatment, you can see it looks like that. And then you can see at the final treatment, it's, it's, it's smaller, okay? So same kind of imaging, but you can see that over the course of the treatment, it's changed. So sometimes the oncologists will want to adjust the plan for when, when those kind of things are observed. Okay, when we use comb beam, it's not going to be used for every patient. If your radiation oncologist wants you to comb beam every patient, please try to talk them out of it because it's time consuming, especially when you're new to it. You, you, you're going to have a learning curve and and that's fine. And it's, you know, it, it shouldn't be used on, you know, softball sized tumors necessarily, or, you know, palliative things, things where the patient might not be able to hold still, you know, can be kind of counterproductive. So you'll work through those work throws with your department. Sometimes the physician will want it daily. We do daily comb beams for most of our prostate patients, for most of our lung patients. 
we actually do do, we do do daily cone beams a lot for, for sarcomas and things on the extremities because we want to make sure that the rotation of the extremities on some, and we do a lot of head and neck patients at Stanford. We usually do weekly cone beams with head and neck patients. Some of the, some of the oncologists do want it daily. So it's kind of a preference for that too. I'm not familiar with Electa. Okay. So I'm not really going to speak to that too much, but they, Electa has the, um, Cone beam says here the cone beam is preferred for IGRT. I didn't realize that elect is difficult to do KV or MV, which seems weird. Um, the KV and MV are, are, are still our bread and butter, okay? Um, especially KV imaging. Let me, just, let me just say that when doing cone beam, it's often useful to, to also do KV imaging, okay? And I'm gonna write that here in text. So that, because that's very important, okay? And here's why. When you're, when you're, especially when you're first getting used to using comb beam, you're gonna get lost in there. You're gonna say, oh my gosh, where am I? Where, where is this matching? You could be on the wrong vertebral body, of the, you know, depending on how good your, your setup marks are. So if you take a quick KV pair, take a, a AP and a right or whatever, you're gonna, you're gonna match up the bony anatomy. You're gonna get in the, the region. You're gonna spend a lot less time screwing around and fine tuning things in the cone beam. So you get your bony anatomy on, that's like your, that's like your structure, right? So you get your bony anatomy on, then you can take the cone beam, you'll be right where you need to be. And, and you'll, you'll be able to spend more time really looking at what you wanna look at, which is soft tissue, rather than trying to match your bony anatomy in the cone beam. It's way easier to match your bony anatomy in KV than in the cone beam. Okay, and if there's if there's one thing that you write down from today's session, that's what I would recommend you writing down. And there, the other thing is, okay, sometimes what you might want to do, is like let's say you spent ten minutes looking at the cone beam, or you spent ten minutes waiting for the physician and looking at the cone beam. The patient's been on the table ten minutes. After you combi might be perfect, but if you have a little bit of a squirmy patient, um, you might take a quick KV pair just to make sure that they didn't move. Or you know, if you have any doubt about your about something that you did with the with the treatment table or something like that, always just take a KV. You can even just take a quick AP KV just to make sure that the table is where you where you want it to be. It's a great verification. And, and it's a very minimal dose, which brings me to the next thing. Alara, as low as reasonably achievable. Okay, I'm just gonna leave this here because I think it's that important. I'm gonna leave that there. So we know Alara means as low as reasonably achievable. We wanna keep our dose to the patient, high to the tumor, low to the rest of the patient. You know, cone beam does give more dose than, than, than KV images because a cone beam consists of like 600 to 1,000 KV images. One cone beam is taking hundreds and hundreds of KV images. So it makes sense that you're going to have a lot more dose. As you learned in the last talk, KV images give doses like in the milligray area. So you have, you have doses that are a lot more from. And so this paper here um, was talking about this paper talked about dose in the, the 1, 1. 1.5 to 4, 4 centigrade, but might be a bit higher. It might be more like 10 centigrade sometimes. There's some settings that you'll be able to learn about when you, when you use comb beams. And you, know, you, can, you can actually adjust the dose the patient receives a little bit by choosing different settings. So that's something to probably discuss um, with the rest of your team. You know, what, are, what are the goals? Usually more dose to the patient means you get more, more information. So you can get a wider field of view. You can see more anatomy, but the trade-off is a little more dose. The trade-off is it takes a little longer to complete the comb. This is just comparing KV to MV. Okay. This is another um, area that I really wanted to focus on, you know, to people who are new, new to comb beam is practical, practical issues, practical concerns. So collisions, you know, depending on the way your center works, whether you're pushing and centering the isocenter and patient on the couch, or you're just offsetting the couch, there's going to be times, at least, and I'm talk, I'm speaking mostly to variant. There's going to be times where the, the machine will ask you, do you want to center? The, and sometimes you're going to have to, 
And that's a good thing because you don't want to crash the gantry into anything. Now, while you're registering or matching your, your images, you might kind of get so focused that, you know, you got to remember where that you move the couch from ISO center, two reasons. Okay, one is if, if um, let's say you forgot to move the couch back, something, something happened. Truebeam, Truebeam really kind of mostly eliminates this risk, but you know, on, on older machines, it could, it could happen that you can move the couch for the comb beam, but forget to move it back and then you beam on. So if the couch is offset five centimeter, which is, you know, typically five or five or eight or something like that, you know, you, you'd have a big geometric. The other thing that could happen on those older machines is you could remember to put the couch back, but you forgot that the gantry cleared down to the back of the table that when the, when the couch was, was centered and then you offset it back, but the beam starts from the posterior and the, you know, the gantry can hit the table. And, you know, don't ask me how I know that. Practical concerns when acquiring comb beam, okay? I think I spoke, spoke to this a little bit earlier. So, okay, for a lot of sites, treatment sites, your weekly comb beam is great. Okay. When you're treating, if you're treating 75 patients a day, you don't wanna do daily comb beams on everybody, especially when you're first getting familiar with it. Okay, now, if you've been doing a lot of comb beams and you're really familiar with it, you can do it comb beam plus image registration in like four minutes, okay? But when you're first starting, you know, it's going to be more like, it's going to be, it's going to be long. Now let's talk about learning curve. Some therapists are going to be better at this. I find that those of us who are, who are who played a lot of video games or something like that when we're younger, you know, or a lot of computer work, you know, it kind of, kind of ties together with letting your eye see what's going on. And it can be helpful to have that background. However, you're going to have others who take more time. They're a little more methodical. Everyone needs to work together. We need to be patient with each other because I'm telling you right now, there's going to be therapists in your department to pick this up like, like that. And there's going to be others who seem to be slower. One is not better than the other. It's good to be slower sometimes. However, those slower people, okay, if the patient's squirming on the table or, you know, whatever difficult patient, maybe a good idea to let the people who are a little faster in and do it. So, but everybody needs to learn. And I'm just telling you right now, there's going to be different learning curves. So please be patient with each other. And also be, please be respectful and know how to work as a team and know when it's better to let somebody else in who is obviously faster. Okay, if you have time for this, I'd highly recommend when you are first using your, your, your comb CT, you... If, if you're able to make a treatment plan on a phantom or this is a ham, you can, you can buy a ham, you take, you put it, treat that ham like a patient, you know, get that ham a warm blanket or whatever, put, put some BBs on it, scan it, have physics, make a plan. This, they even put bolus on this one where I used to work. The reason you scan a ham is because it looks a lot like a patient's, you know, thigh. So you have muscles, you have bone. So you set that ham up in the treatment room on your new linear accelerator and you do comb beams on your ham, okay? And you practice and you practice matching the anatomy on the ham. It works great. I, I don't know why it just works better than a, than a, uh, than a phantom because phantom doesn't have that, phantoms don't have that musculature. So this can help you get comfortable. So scan a ham, treatment plan, the ham, and then when you set the ham up, don't set it up right to your CT isomarks, set it up offset. So you have to work with it and you have to learn how the image matching, the image registration works. Okay. Oh, and freeze the ham when you're not using it so that you can, you can, you know, because they, they will still spoil. All right, we're going to go through some, some math. Oh, uh, I have a question. Is it possible to do CBCT if the equipment has no KV attachment? No, but there are, there are, there are issues. There are places that have developed something called a CT on rails. So that would be, that would be like a, you could look into that. CT on rails is, gives, gives you a, a, a CT scan, but there's no, there's no KV attachment. So it's, I don't know. It's, it's, it's an, it's kind of a, kind of a, 
method they used, but not as good as comb beam because it's just not as useful because you can't have the KVs. But no, but you know what? Who asked the question? Okay, I don't know. I I think it was was it Paul? Paul asked the question. You can you can get you can get the KV on it. You can get the KV attachment on onto onto your machine, certain machine, certain varying machines, you can get a retrofitted KV attachment. All right, there's a couple more things I want to talk about. About in the next section, we're going to demonstrate image matching. If you have very little, even if you have a lot of experience, it's hard to watch another person do an image registration. You kind of just got, got to get in there and you got to, you got to do the registration because here's why you have these tools to look at the image and you're using your, your mouse and you're using your keyboard and you're using your brain to like match two images that are different images and you use the tools and you click and, and you'll see this, we'll, we'll demonstrate it. Um, you use the tools to meld or, you know, mesh the images together and your brain's looking at those pictures and trying to match it. So if you're watching somebody else do it, their brain's working at a whole different thing. They're focusing on a different part of the picture. It's kind of hard to watch somebody else do this. So the next se section, I'm going to kind of get your feet wet with, with what we're looking at when we match images. And to get the most out of this, please try to focus on these things. Don't try to, don't try to absorb it all because, but I want you to recognize, this is a good start in getting your feet wet. Recognize which, which image is cone beam and which is the planning CT, okay? That's the first one I want you to just focus on because here's why. Your doctor's gonna say, oh, which one am I looking at? Believe me, they're, they're gonna come there and they're gonna, start, they're gonna start looking and they're gonna be like, oh, is that the comb beam or is that the planning CT? And if you can tell them that, they'll, they will appreciate it. Okay, second thing is I want you to just think about tours. Okay. I'll talk about that as we realize the importance of looking at the di three different planes. Okay. And just, do you remember what the three planes are? You can write it in, in chat. Okay. Okay. Now this last part, practice focusing in on a single part of the image. Okay. These are, these are kind of some of the important concepts when you're doing comb beans. Okay. Up on your toolbar, this is variant. Up on your toolbar, you're gonna have all of these different things. You're gonna, you're gonna be able to turn on your matching or not. You're gonna auto match. You're gonna have these different view boxes. You have measurement tools if you want them. They're less important. You have things here where you can turn some of the annotations off, okay? Play around with that when you get it, okay? Just don't let people rush you, learn it all. Don't take shortcuts, learn it all. You'll be more efficient in the long run if you learn it all. Remember, sometimes you can't learn everything all at once, but if you kind of learn a little at a time. All right, let's see. Let's look at some registrations. All right, okay, Halcyon machine. Yes, Halcyon machine has KV within the bore. Halcyon machine is an adaptive radiation therapy machine it's i don't i've never used it but i believe it's top of the line and i believe it's kind of the future so yes okay what's going on here the, this is an image registration we have this is planning scan this is planning scan this is comb beam this is comb beam okay this is called a spotlight comb beam you have a smaller field of view. The reason we like to do that is because we only have to turn the gantry about 180 degrees and it's faster and it's less dose to the patient. So we're looking at a prostate uh, cancer patient and we're making sure all the anatomy's on. We're making sure the bladder's full enough. On this particular patient, the bladder is, is full enough. You can, you can see here, that the bladder is matching into the contour. 
this is an this here's a very important concept to remember okay when you're looking at a cone beam registration on a treatment plan your contours live with the planning ct okay so watch watch here these these contours this red contour the prostate that that's that that is based on this planning ct and it's also going to stick with it now when you move the two images to match them those contours will move okay onto where you want them to be typically they're not going to contour bone you just match the bone to get it in the ballpark and then you look at the soft tissues you want to look at all right i'll explain more about that later but that's a, that's a good concept to keep in mind. All right, should we, what time is it? Well, I'm gonna skip another prostate. We don't wanna talk about that more. This is a pelvis, okay? We can look at this brief, another pelvis. This is a GYN. So in the last image, it was just showing that we were in the, we, were, we had the bony anatomy matched up. Okay, so let's kind of go over the concepts again that we were just talking about. What we're looking at, here is a comb beam and the comb beam is yeah the comb beam is overlaid on i'm sorry that was the planning ct that was the planning ct the comb beam is in this is in this little box this is the other tool you can use most people seem to prefer this tool to overlay the two, most people prefer this square. I don't, I prefer the, the checkerboard like you saw in the last one. Okay, so here's the comb beam. Again, it's it's kind of difficult sometimes to look at this stuff you know, as a video. When you're there, you have more control. Well, this goes back, recognize which is the comb beam, which is the planning CT. I mean, that's, believe me, that's half the battle. This is a video I made about how to match. Let's, I'm gonna turn the sound on and just, I'm going to just play it. Pancreas. So this is the comb beam. You have a spotlight comb beam. See the small field of view. Let's go look at the planning scan. See bony anatomy is off quite a bit. See the spine's off. And the pink area here is the kind of the target area. So I'm going to go to the isocenter. I'm going to switch my view so I can make sure my spine is uh, lined up in and out first. Using my preferred tool here, which is this checkerboard. I want to make sure we can see how far off we're off left to right. So we'll just start with the bony anatomy. That this vertebral body is, is this one, I believe, but I'm going to not assume that yet. I'm going to look at another view. So I'll bring it around. I'm going to pause to it for a second. I'm going to use the different. Um, there is a question. What is the slice thickness of the comb beam CT? And, uh, and how do you match it with the slice thickness of the, the planning CT? I don't know. It's magic. It is different. The, the, comb, the comb beam slice thickness is different. I think it depends on the machine, but it's, it's a great question. And it's, it's, I would recommend talking to your physicist about that. But I will say, Dennis, that you, as a user should not ever have to consider that except there you know you should yeah you know you should have the knowledge that that when you're when you're comparing these two over here on the over here on the, the axial view or the transverse view that you're you're looking at a volume you're not looking you're not looking at exactly a slice you're looking at a volume it might be a volume of of one millimeter for something like a radio surgery it might be a volume of um you know i'm saying one millimeter thick it might be a it might be a volume of you know two millimeters or three it's a really great question that you're asking now if you're ever thinking that oh well i don't know if the geometry matches because i did like a five millimeter planning planning slice and now I'm doing a, a 2.5 millimeter comb beam slice. Now that should match up perfectly. 
but you can always use that KV, okay, just to verify that you're not off a little bit on the, because which, which plane, which direction would you be off if there was some sort of misregistration based on the slice thickness? You'd be off on the longitudinal axis. So you could take a, you could take a KV image afterwards to come. Really good question. Actually, it's something that I, that I struggled with a bit too when I first, first started doing these. That like, well, if this one was here and this one was here, but when, because you're looking at volumes of tissue, it, it, it averages out. And I think that the, the, the manufacturers of the machines have, have really refined the algorithms of the reconstructions. Okay, so that it's pretty seamless, right? What you're looking at with these matches does have some, have some inherent, you know, inaccuracies. I mean, because we're talking about geometry with radiation therapy, you know, so it's always a question of how accurate, you know, for instance, the, the accurate, the mechanical accuracy of the machine, you know, rotating around that ISO center. Well, we, that's two millimeters, you know, so there's all these different accuracies. You can dive deep. Good question for your physicist. In fact, I might have to mention it when I see them on Monday. You know what? You're all going to have a access to this presentation. Now, on some of these, some of these videos, there's a narration. Some of it's me. Some of it's someone else. Okay. Some of them are in Spanish, but you can look at these yourselves. I'm not going to go through each one and play them because you can look at them. I'd like to just show some more body parts. Okay. So this is, this is, I'm going to just mute this here. This is the chest can be a challenging site to, to do image registrations on for a lot of reasons. Okay. If you don't have, you don't have the, the apex of the lung, it can be actually pretty easy to, to mismatch this in and out because the thoracic vertebra all look alike. And carina can move in rel rel relation to the thoracic vertebra. So, however, those are your friends, the apex of the lung. You're gonna, just like KV matching, you're gonna look at discs and that's how you're gonna get your in and out lined up. Another thing I didn't really mention earlier, okay? You can see that she's moving between the comb beam and the planning CT rapidly. You can, you can do that by flipping this thing here in Varian, or you can press control A. I don't know how it works in Electa, but along with those other tools, like the spyglass that we, we were looking at, that rectangular thing, control A is something you can use too. So you can see that as she presses control A, these contours, this one of the carina and this one of the target, you see those, those stay, okay? The reason why you don't see them up here is because they're not con they're not contoured up there. Let's rewind that for a second. That's an important concept. All right, I want to rewind this. I want to I want you to get this. This is this is like another thing you need to learn soon when you do comb beams, and it might be intuitive to you. Okay, look at this blue slice. Okay, you see this blue thing here, this bar. Yeah, it's. All right, I'm going to rewind it because this is like the last point I'm going to make today. Because then we're going to go into questions. Okay. She's scrolling through this blue bar here. This shows where she is in the transverse. Watch the blue bar. Watch this blue bar move when she when when this when she scrolls through. Okay, so this here is the contour of this, and it's also the contour of this. Okay, the spinal cord here. That's the contour of this. You don't see it. Why don't you see it in here? You're gonna. If she keeps scrolling back, you're going to see it. But why don't you see that right there? It's because this green bar is right here. That's the sagittal view. Okay, see the blue bar? See it's scrolling down? No contours here? Now you see contours because they're contoured there. Okay, so when you're, do, when you're registering comb beams, you have to be aware of where you are. Okay, so if you, you think you're down here matching... Oh, everything looks great down here. Well, guess what? Target's up here somewhere. Target's here. You don't, if things aren't perfect down here, but they're perfect up here, I think you have a strong case for treating the patient, not a vice versa, okay? You don't, I don't care what this patient's little toe looks like right now. I wanna match in the mediastinum 
I want this to all look perfect. Now, lungs can be challenging just because that after a few days of treatment, sometimes you have a big lung tumor, everything looks different. It's like, what do we do now? This, this, this looks, this looks like it matches pretty good today. Okay. But you know, if this patient was planned three weeks ago and we've been zapping this thing for three weeks, they, I, everything can look different. And then plus they just have more, you know, morbidity and they, they might have fluid buildup or loss of fluid buildup and, you know, some, it doesn't always look as perfect as this looks. This looks pretty good. Even though we see that, even though everything's matched up right now, well, hey, look, this spinal cord here is not, you get a, if you can get a, get a linear accelerator with a, with a couch that adjusts for your, your pitch tilt and roll, it's the greatest thing. Okay. I hope I got, I hope I got you started. I hope I was addressing your needs. I have in the presentation, my email please feel free to email me if I can be of any service. And are there any questions? I'm going to just scroll down and we can just recap. That's Electa stuff. Please, it, please review some of these, these videos that are, that are narrated or even the ones that aren't. Try to figure out what's going on there. Try to get a grasp of some of these, some of these issues. <clears throat> Challenge yourself to identify what the cone beam is and what the planning CT is. Because there's a lot of good stuff in here. I'm sorry that I didn't have time to go over it all. I just want to recap the uh, summary again. Okay, it is an important tool, cone beam is. You don't need it every day, but sometimes you do. <laughs> sorry, that's a little bit contradictory. Okay, so always remember to finish by checking the big picture. That's because if you're on, if you're on in one in one plane, if you're on your match and the transverse plane. If you have something that's really kind of tube shaped, like superior inferiorly, you could be off in and out. I, I, I really like Dennis's question where he asked about the slice thickness of the cone beam versus the slice thickness of the, of the treatment planning scan. So, and then have a, an imaging policy. Okay. When are you going to re-image a cone beam? At Stanford, we re do re-image cone beams. We re-image cone beams several times sometimes for our stereotactic body radiation therapy, okay? Because if the patient's moving around or the breathing is, is not reliable, you're given that high dose in a day, you're given something like, you know, 1200 centigrade or something or 800 centigrade to an abdominal tumor, you know, you're going to re-cone beam. You're not going to just always just do that with KV images or you can even do fluoro too.